So I have also the pleasure of collaborating with Evine in the Center for Interstellar Catalysis that I'm heading. And the purpose of this center is to find out or to discover if the molecular building blocks of life, amino acids, DNA bases, sugars, and fatty acids, can be formed in interstellar space even before the formation of stars and planets. Evine told you about a lot of the work she has been doing with observing what happens in interstellar space. My focus and my area of expertise is to go into the lab and see, can we recreate the conditions of interstellar space and see how complex molecules can we create under these conditions. So you've already heard a lot about interstellar space, these regions, the interstellar dust and molecular clouds that we are really interested in in this context. An example of such a one is the Eagle Nebula you can see on the image here. So the beautiful colors are attributed to light emitted from atoms and ions. But as Avin told you, what's most uh, interesting for us is actually the darker patches, because these are the regions where the dust and molecules are so dense that they can shield out the light from the surrounding stars, and we can get down to these extremely low temperatures, minus 263 degrees, where gravity can win over pressure and the clouds can collapse, collapse under their own weight, and we can form new stars and planetary systems. So the Eagle Nebula is a giant interstellar dust and molecular cloud in the Serpent's constellation, 7,000 light years away from us. It's 140 light years from one end to the other. So really a giant structure. And if we zoom in on these dark regions, the densest regions where new stars and planetary, uh, planets form, then we have these pillars of creation. So in here, new stars are being born. It's in these regions, the center of these areas, that we have these extremely low temperatures. And also, even if I say they're dense, as Evine already said, it's actually quite a good vacuum in there, a thousand times better than what we can normally make in the laboratory. So when these... How can we know anything about the materials that are in these interstellar dust and molecular clouds? Well, we have to go in and look at the specific wavelengths in which the different atoms and molecules, or dust grains, absorb light. And Devin already introduced the James Webb Space Telescope that particularly was looking in the infrared, mid-infrared region. And this is, for example, the micrometer region. You can see some of the transitions up here. And that's exactly where we can detect molecules. So what you see here is a spectrum. And the top, you can see that there's like a, a cloudy um, shape, and that's one of these interstellar clouds. This one is not so dense, so if there's a star behind it, you can see the light from that star passing through the, the cloud. But you will also see that some of the colors are missing. This, of course, is, then is the microwave region, so you have to extend your normal idea of what colors are to also microwaves. So what we can see is, if you look at these black dots up there, that's the measurements, and you can see that there's like an overall shape that's the, the light emitted by the star behind this cloud. But then you can see there are some dips, and this is where molecules in the cloud are absorbing the light. And you can see there's a big dip at around three micrometer, and that's where the water molecule is absorbing light. And maybe some of you actually know that already, because if you have a microwave oven at home, then this will typically excite the water molecules by irradiating it with, with the electromagnetic radiation at around these three micrometer. So there's water ice out there in space and the dust grains. Evine already told you so. There's also the CH, which is a carbon and a hydrogen um, atom bound in a molecule that's vibrating next to each other. And this is a typical signature that we have suit-like particles in interstellar space. And then you can see up at around 10 micrometer, or 9.7 micrometer, there's a strong band, absorption band, and that's from these sand-like uh, sand grains the silicates, so our sand particles in interstellar space. So our dust grains out there, they are either the soot particles, carbonaceous grains, they're the sand particles, the silicates, or if we are in the densest regions, they can be covered by layers of ice. And the, the extremely low temperatures we have in interstellar space, ice is not just water, it's also carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, methanol, 
all of these molecules we normally know as gases here on Earth, they will freeze out and form an ice at these extremely low temperatures. So the two pictures you can see up, up on the top, that's pictures of, of uh, dust grains that were picked up in aerogel on the wings of very high flying planes. And uh, they were taken down to Earth and extracted, and one could see by, these, by the way they were composed that they were actually older than our own solar system. So there are examples of, of dust grains that actually existed already before our star and planetary system was formed. So the one you have on the, the left, that's a graphitic onion-like particle, so layers of graphite wrapped around each other in an onion-like structure. So that's one of these suit particles. And on the right, there's a silicate, so a, a sand grain type particle um, that you can see very holy and porous. Apart from the dust grains, we have, of course, a lot of atoms and molecules in interstellar space. Evine told you already there was so much complex chemistry in space, much more than what you would expect for these very low temperatures and very low pressures. 225 molecules have been detected so far. Each year, new molecules are added to the list. And some of these are biologically relevant, like lycalaldehyde. You can see up there, a simple sugar has been detected. There's also big molecules like carbon-60, Buckminster fullerene, or um, the buckyball, you may know it as. And then, of course, we have our dust grains. So, I said I'm heading the Center for Interstellar Catalysis, and you may ask, what is catalysis? And uh, catalysis, you may know from car exhaust in your car, if you have such one, that's Catalysts, small metal catalysts sit there and clean part of the exhaust. It's also used in industry when, for example, you make fertilizers. There's a lot of catalysts being used there. Here on Earth, this is normally metals or metal oxides. It's a huge industry. But out in space, it's these our carbonaceous particles, our silicate particles, and these ice-coated particles. They're the ones that act as catalysts. So a catalyst helps a reaction to occur. And in interstellar space, the way these grains help the, the reaction to occur is that they provide a meeting place and they can take away excess energy. So Evine showed you actually already a simulation of how water molecules could be made on such a dust grain. Here we look at an even simpler process. Hydrogen atoms coming in on the surface, moving around on the surface, finding each other, forming a molecular hydrogen, and then depositing the energy that's released in this process into the dust grain surface before they dissolve off into interstellar space. So the dust grains are catalysts for these chemical reactions. This was for hydrogen, Evine showed you water, but most of the complex molecules we expect are made via such catalytic reactions on the surface of interstellar dust. So the thought is, how complex molecules can we make? Can we make even molecules that are these molecular building blocks of life in space. And specifically, we are interested in, can we make the amino acids? Can we make, for example, glycine? Can we make the sugars, for example, right? So as you say, the amino acids, they're part of our proteins. If we look at, at the sugars and the DNA bases, that's what make up uh, the DNA helix. If we look at the fatty acids, that's what forms the, the layers of the cells that make up our body. So can we make all of these types of molecules in space that form the basis of life as we know it? There's a big scheme over here that's an example of experiments actually happening at, at uh, Leiden University where they looked at the pathways towards forming sugar at very low temperatures. So they started with the carbon monoxide and added hydrogen, and then followed all the way up. And you can see the, the molecules that are marked in red. That's so far that they have gotten in the lab so far. So they can make glycolaldehyde or glyceraldehyde that's a little bit more complex than the glycolaldehyde that's been detected in space, and they can make glycerol under conditions that we find in interstellar space. And there are still some steps to go to get all the way up to ribose. That's one of these sugars that are part of our DNA. So you can then ask, does it even matter? What does it matter if we find out that we can make these molecular building blocks of life in space? Does it have any impact if they're there? And of course, the 
answer to that is that it's the material of the original interstellar dust and molecular cloud that ends up forming the stars, the planets, the moons, the comets, and the asteroids. And of course, if material ends up in the star, it will be so heavily processed that it will lose all memory of, of what molecules were originally part of it. But if we look on the outer sides of this disk where the planets are forming, then on the outer parts, there's very little healing, heating of the material. And that means the original molecules can actually survive and end up being part of comets that are made out there and that later can deliver material down to the surface of newly formed planets. So this could have happened to our own Earth when it was formed, and it's actually believed that a lot of the water we have on Earth today, maybe all of it, comes from comets that delivered material, or water molecules, down to our planets. Um, yes. So if we can find out that we can make these molecular building blocks of life already before the formation of stars and planets, this would of course mean that they could be delivered down, could have been delivered down to our own Earth, but also to other planets across the universe forming around other stars. Good. So our aim then is to find out, can we really form these molecular building blocks of life in interstellar space before the formation of stars and planets? And if we want to answer that, we have to bring together a lot of different expertise. And we are bringing together in our center observations. Evine told you already about that, and that's of course her area in the center, and then we bring together theoretical calculations where you try to simulate the formation of these complex molecules using machine learning techniques, for example. And then we have the laboratories, my own laboratories in Aarhus, where we try to look on these soot particles and, and the sand grains and see how complex molecules can we make on them. What happens if we begin to add a little bit of water and it begins to grow? How does that change the conditions? And then also at Leiden University, we have uh, collaborated with a group that looks at the thicker ices and how complex molecules can we make in them. So myself and Björk Hammer at Aarhus University, Björk is doing the, the theory, and then in Leiden we have uh, Harold Linnert, looking at the ice layers, thicker ice layers, and the Wien looking towards the sky and seeing what is actually discovered out there. And when we started the center, of course, we got a lot of people to join us in this work, and you can see the average age has much decreased after we started recruiting students and young researchers into the center. So we are now around 30 people working to answer this question. And there are people from all over the world, from India, from Brazil, from China, from Taiwan, from all over Europe, trying to see if we together can answer these questions. My area is the laboratory, so trying to recreate interstellar conditions in the lab by building huge um, stainless steel canisters like you, the one you can see here, in which we can get down to pressures that are almost as good, around a thousand times less good than what we have in interstellar space. But the very low temperatures, those we can create, we can even make lower temperatures than the ones we find in the interstellar dust and molecular clouds. So I said I can look at single atoms on the surface, and the way I do this is I have a scanning tunneling microscope. In this, I have a metal tip, it can be a tungsten tip, that I can move to within a millionth of the width of a hair from the surface that I want to look at. Then I put a voltage in between them, and then when the tip is that close to the surface, electrons can jump through vacuum by quantum mechanical tunneling. And the shorter the distance is, the easier it is for them to jump, and that means there'll be, the closer I get to the surface, the larger will be the current that these electrons make. If I then move my tip over the surface, because this tunneling is so sensitive to the distance, there will be a little bit of a difference in the current depending on whether I'm right above an atom or in between two atoms. So I can move the tip over the surface with a constant current, and then it has to move up and down whenever it gets above one atom to keep the current constant. And in that way, I can actually see the individual atoms in the surface. And if I scan the STM over a full surface, I can make a picture of what is happening 
on the surface. It's extremely demanding because I have to be so close to the surface and there cannot be any vibrations between the tip and the surface because then it would wash away this atomic resolution where we can see the individual atoms. So the tip is around three centimeter. I have to move it a tenth of a nanometer above the surface and the vibrations has to be lower than a tenth of that so to allow me to see the atoms. If I scaled up the STM to the size of the Eiffel Tower, it would correspond to trying to move the Eiffel Tower one micrometer above the ground, and the vibrations between the Eiffel Tower and the ground would have to be less than one-tenth of a micron. So very demanding to do in the lab. But we do it, and that allows us to see single atoms on a surface. And here you have one example. If you remember the graphitic onion particle and the hydrogen atoms coming in, this is what that would pretty much look like. We have a graphite surface. You can see a little bit of structure in the back here in the brown. That's the carbon atoms in the graphite surface. And then we send in hydrogen atoms, and they move around on the surface until they find another hydrogen atom, and they stick right next to each other and form these elongated structures that you can see in the image. So each of these elongated bright orange structures, well, yellow structures, that's two hydrogen atoms sitting next to each other, bound to the carbon but ready to form a hydrogen molecule as soon as we start heating. Ewen talked about the polycyclic hydrocarbons. There's a lot of them in space. Down here, we hear about them because they're carcinogenic, a main product in the exhaust from diesel cars. What you can see over here are spectral comparisons between diesel exhaust from the German Autobahn on top and then emission from these PAHs in the Orion bar, part of the Orion nebula. So, they are there, both places, but maybe in interstellar space, they can actually do some good. They can maybe help form these molecular building blocks of life. So we look at what happens, and these are theoretical calculations. If the hydrogen atoms come in and bind to these molecules, we can add more and more. And at some point, we can also begin to abstract uh, and form H2 molecules via these processes. So these polysaccharomatic hydrocarbons also act as catalysts. And now we can put them down on a surface and then we can send the hydrogen atoms down onto these molecules. And if we do that, then we can see with submolecular resolution how the hydrogen atoms are binding. So you can see in the top right is just a cornine molecule, one of these polysaccharomatic hydrocarbons. You can see the molecule below, black is carbon, white is hydrogen. And you can see how such a molecule look in the STM. And then all of the other places where we have these brighter parts of the molecules, that's where the hydrogen atoms has bound to the molecule and, and we have made these more complex structures. And you can see they light up in all kinds of different ways. Some of them, half the molecule lights up and that fits with half of the molecule being filled with hydrogen atoms. So we can really follow these re uh, reactions on the sub-molecular level. So I showed you a little bit about how we can look at the bare uh, carbonaceous grain surfaces, our suit-like particles, and see how they interact with, for example, hydrogen. What happens if we begin to grow layers of ice? You saw a simulation of that on a dust grain. How does it look in the lab? And of course, as you say, so far, we are still only doing them by putting down the molecules. We are still not at a point where we make them in situ and then look at the structure. But what I show you here, is what structure water molecules will form if we put them down on a surface at very low temperatures, minus 230 Kelvin in this case. We can also do it even lower down to these 10 Kelvin above absolute zero, but it still looks pretty much the same. So these two clusters, that's water clusters formed at very low temperatures on a graphite surface, imaged again with this scanning tunneling microscope. And when you look at them, maybe you feel they look a little bit like ice crystals, but on the other hand, they're really not that crystalline, they're quite disordered. And actually, if we look even closer, what we can see is that the structure they have is a fractal structure. And what can analyze fractals? We can determine their dimension. And if we do this for these structures that we're looking at, then we find that they have a fractal dimension of 1.7. And this is known from physics theory that this is exactly what you get if you have this situation that when a water molecule hits another water molecule, they're locked in place and cannot move at all. In your normal ice crystal, 
the water molecules move around and make the most energetically favorable structure. So they make a crystal structure because they can move with respect to each other. But at these low temperatures, there's no movement. They're just locked in place where they land. And that's why we get these very open fractal-like structures that can then act as catalysts for molecule formation. But that's the next step that we are still waiting for. So, are there any news? What happens, for example, in the laboratories in Leiden, in which they were looking at what happens in the even thicker ices? And what they have seen there last year is that it is actually possible to make one of these molecular building blocks of life at the extremely low temperatures that we find in interstellar space. And that is this simplest amino acid, glycine. So they have shown that in the thick ices, starting from carbon, nitrogen, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, oxygen, and hydrogen atoms that they send in, these molecules can react together and form the glycine molecule. So we have actually made the very first step in that direction to show that it is actually possible to at least make one amino acid under interstellar conditions. Still not been detected out there, but at least now we know that in the interstellar clouds from which the stars and planetary systems form, it should actually be able, possible to form glycine even before the stars and planets were formed. And indeed, if we look at some of the cometary missions, glycine has actually also been detected on some of these comets, so it kind of confirms this idea that if we have these complex molecules in our original cloud, they should also end up in the comets. So both on Comet Vil 2 and also on 67P Shuryumu Yoroshimenko, um, glycine has actually been detected. So that is in accord together. Now we have both the lab experiments, we have the cometary detection. Now we can only hope that James Webb Space Telescope will be able to maybe also detect some of these molecules in space. So of course, there's a lot more to do. We don't know if it ends with this sing first single amino acid or we can continue going, make much more amino acids, make the DNA bases, make the sugars, make the fatty acid. The question is still out on that. But our hope is that by studying these processes, we'll be able to see were they actually able, should they be present in the interstellar dust and molecular cloud. If they are present, they could be delivered to the surface of newly forming planets, our own Earth back in time, but also other planets across the galaxy. If they really impacted on the origin of life, we will probably never know, but at least what we will be able to say is that we can establish what are the starting conditions for the origin of life, what molecules were available that could have formed a part in these processes. So I will end by... Uh, giving you now a lot of choice. Because if someone asks you, do you think that life came from space? Now you're completely free to choose your answer. Because uh, you can interpret the question to mean did aliens come with spaceships, put life down on Earth? And then, I'm not sure all of you, but most of you would probably say, uh, probably not. It's probably not how it started. You can also interpret the question to mean this, we are all made of stardust, all the elements in our body except for hydrogen were made in the stellar cores before our present star. So in that way, of course, yes, we are all made of stardust, so of course life comes from the star. Or you can take the third option, which is the one I have tried to present to you today, this question whether the molecular building blocks of life actually had an origin in interstellar space. And in that case, the jury is still out, and the answer must be a maybe. Thank you. Mm -hmm.